the FBI for a long time on this channel has been the subject of some criticism. Most of it, I think, is well deserved. Specifically, we've had some problems with their preparation for January 6. We've had some questions about what's going on with the Governor Whitmer investigation. And we also now have the Democrats who are not too happy about what the FBI is doing because back during the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings, when we were going through the Supreme Court nomination for the latest Supreme Court judge prior to Amy Coney Barrett, we had Judge Kavanaugh. And you remember this was where we had the the whole allegation that, that this guy was some sort of a sexual deviant, I guess, back when he was in high school. So allegations from 25, 30 years ago popped up. And the FBI, after all these, you know, 30 year old allegations started to crop up, we have a bunch of people throughout the country who allegedly had tips. They wanted to sort of report on Brett Kavanaugh's background when that when this was at its height. And what happened was apparently the FBI set up a tip line said, hey, send us your tips on Kavanaugh, and then they didn't do anything with it. So they just said, well, well, we're just gonna send a couple of those over to the White House, and we're just gonna forget about the rest of them. So the Democrats are now out saying, what? We didn't want Kavanaugh on there in the first place. They're saying we knew that he was a sexual deviant, and all of this information might have been useful back when this was working its way through our political system. So let's go to NBC News and see what they have to say about it. It says Democrats blast the FBI as new details of the Kavanaugh inquiry emerge. FBI said it got 4,500 tips about then Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh forwarded, quote, the relevant ones over to the White House counsel. So a group of Democratic senators are unhappy about that, saying these new details are, are concerning because they wanted a very thorough investigation into Kavanaugh. Senator Whitehouse, the guy who apparently is a part of a, I guess, a racist beach club, something like that, needs to distract from that a little bit. So now he's going after the FBI saying that the Congressional Affairs Office acknowledged the department conducted only 10 additional interviews in its supplemental investigation, even though it received over 4,500 tips. Tyson said the relevant tips from phone call and messages were forwarded to counsel. It's unclear what happened to the tips after that. So on the one hand, you could say, all right, well, maybe they were doing their job, right? Maybe there was 4,500 Democrats who were saying, yeah, Kavanaugh, you know, molested me also. And the FBI said, no, you didn't because you weren't alive 35 years ago. And they just got rid of, you know, 4,490 different uh, tips that were just useless. And so that might be, uh, you know, I guess one way to, uh, to approach it. But I would probably suspect that there's a pattern here, right? The FBI has been pretty much ineffective on a lot of other things. So why wouldn't they have botched this one also, right? I, pro I think the Democrats are probably onto something, right? They probably did screw it up because they screw most things up, including routine investigations. So that's happening. Now, the FBI seems to be, and to other people, to be out there trying to do a little bit of damage control. This caught the eye of Katie Pavlich over at Town Hall. You can see this here. She uh, posted and said that the FBI is attempting to do damage control after initiating a little provocative there, initiating the Whitmer kidnapping plot, right? So uh, you could say provocative or the truth, right? We still don't know really the details, but what she's referencing is some of this conversation that we're seeing from the FBI, from their Twitter account. This is what it looks like. And they posted this on July 21, a couple days ago, right? Said that partnerships are key to disrupting violent plots. And you're going to see the language start to work its way back towards a lot of that fear language, right? Anytime we start to question the legitimacy of our government or our intelligence agencies, the first thing they do is they say, well, we're protecting you from terrorists. You don't want terrorism, do you? You don't want your house to be blown up, do you? You don't want another 9-11 or an insurrection, which was way worse than that, do you? That's why you need the FBI. So we start to see that, right? Protecting the United States from terrorist attacks is the FBI's top priority. We work closely with our partners to disrupt violent plots and keep our communities safe from harm. Remember this, I've, I, we, the last time the FBI posted a statement, we spent a lot of time talking about it. It was like two, two or three sentences, the last one, but it was precision engineered persuasion, right? They, they, they're, they're an intelligence agency. They're very good at, at language and communication. So you would imagine that their tweets would be top notch and they are right. They're, they're very, very provocative. Protecting the United States is what we do from what from terrorist attacks. And it's our top priority. Well, then why every single day on your Twitter account, are you posting pictures of grandma in the, in the congressional buildings, right? Trying to find all of those people because 
that seems like to us what you're doing. That's where most of your efforts are going because that's what we see you talking about all the time. We've been hearing this from a lot of people from the FBI, including Christopher Ray and many others talking about domestic violent extremism, talking about domestic terrorism, talking about what was uh, what occurred on January 6th being the worst thing that has ever happened in this country since the Civil War. I think Biden even said that. You're a part of his his executive branch. So we know what, what this means to you. The question is, is that constitutional? Is what you're trying to do now something that is allowable under the law? And we're going to get there soon enough when we get to Jill Sanborn, who is somebody who's going to tell us how the FBI balances these things. We have the duty to protect American lives. We have the duty to preserve the Constitution. The FBI's got these two little, you know, this balancing act to deal with. So we're going to see how they, how, how their posture works around there. In spite, in light of the, these, the, the most recent posts from the FBI, we see a lot of people taking the opportunity to dunk on them. Sean Davis posted, are you the same FBI that rented an apartment for two to the 9-11 hijackers? The same FBI that claimed the attempted assassination of Republicans was, quote, suicide by cop? The same FBI that claimed that the Fort Hood was the workplace violence? Or was that a different FBI, right? And sort of the list goes on and on, right? I think the uh, the Pulse nightclub shooting was sort of mis- was mis- uh, uh, characterized at the outset. I, I still don't know what the heck happened to the Las Vegas shooter, whatever was the story there. You know, that one's still gone. So uh, you know, I'm not real sure that the FBI is all that that focused on what they claim to be. Okay. And then we have Ron Coleman, another lawyer over here, says it doesn't count if you set the fire yourself, punks. He, uh, we have McKay Coppin says uh, about that plot to kidnap the governor of Michigan, right? BuzzFeed wrote this article that I have not covered yet here on this channel. Very, very interesting article, but it's a massive one. So I just haven't had the time to sit down and break through it. But we all have been talking about this anyways. And BuzzFeed says an examination of the case talking about the kidnapping case from uh, Michigan says that some of those informants that were involved in the case acting under the direction of the FBI played a far larger role than was previously reported. They worked in secret. They did more than just passively observe. They report and report on the actions. They had a hand in nearly every aspect of the alleged plot, starting with its inception. The extent of their involvement raises questions as to whether there would have been a conspiracy without them, right? It's, it's the but for. Would this have happened but for the FBI? Were they, were they that, 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 chain that causal link in the execution of any of these allegations well according to buzzfeed maybe not all right so let's take a step back we now know that there's a lot of improprieties that have been circling the, the fbi for a long time we have an executive assistant director this woman here is named jill sanborn and she was on a podcast with the fbi back in may because that's when she got the job right she, she got named as the executive assistant director to the national security branch in may 2021 she ensures that the fbi executes its mission to defend the united states and its interests from national security threat recently served the assistant director of counterterrorism at fbi headquarters in washington so she's sort of a career fed began her career as a special agent in 1998 assigned to the phoenix field office shout out to investigate bank fraud she joined the phoenix joint terrorism task force in 2001 2006 added to the counterterrorism division also deployed to iraq saudi arabia uk kenya pakistan detailed to the cia's counterterrorism center acting director for law enforcement okay lifelong fed with the fbi on entire her entire career and she was on a podcast called the changing nature of the threat and how you can help right this was something posted this year soon after she got uh, appointed to this position and we've been seeing this shift right we've been seeing this from all of our law enforcement agencies all throughout the country everybody's coming out and reframing it they're saying well now we got to really focus on gun violence right it's gun violence there was a big wave of defund the police and law enforcement reform but that all changed after january 6 and after joe biden won the presidency then the entire structure of the united states reoriented itself it said okay well that was necessary to remove donald trump and so we're going to get back into you know total control and and just massive totalitarian you know law enforcement ideals as it pertains to the united states citizenry so this is something that we have just seen the shift continue on we have many different people from the DOD 
to Attorney General Merrick Garland, to President Biden himself, Kamala Harris. We have Christopher Wray. We have Austin Lloyd. We have many, many people who are all part of the Biden administration refocusing, reorienting this, this national security threat perspective to be focused on domestic issues, right? We've heard about white supremacy. We've heard about all of the different militia groups that are dangerous. We've seen time and again, white supremacy, this, this concept of white supremacy and these militias being a number one threat to the United States of America. And so the question from all of these people now being sort of put slotted into positions of power, we're in the first six months of Biden's office uh, administration, folks. They're all being slotted in here and they're telling us what the next steps are. They're telling us what their, their law enforcement posture is going to be, how they see the job, how are they going to be enforcing the law, and what types of cases are they going to be investigating. So Jill Sanborn was now on this podcast, and we're going to listen into a couple clips. It's not video, it's audio only, and we're going to check out a few of them. This is, we've got four clips from her. They're about 30 seconds apiece, so we're not going to spend a ton of time on them. And they sort of get progressively worse, and they're going to tell a little bit of a story for us. So here is Jill Sanborn. The first one, she's asked a question about, well, you know, the FBI, what do you do? And, and, and tell me you know, a little bit about your perspective on what the FBI means. Everybody knows that we're the premier law enforcement agency in the country, if not the world. And we can put really? any of the puzzles back together after an attack. We can figure out who did it and take that case to court. We've done it and shown our success in the time and time and time again. Okay, so, you know, we're a premier agent. She, she's out there advocating for her, her you know, the FBI. Okay, uh, it's debatable, I would say. I think it's pretty debatable. You know, I think that a competent agency would have probably uh, foreseen a domestic insurrectionist plot brewing, and they would have done something to prevent that from happening if that was the case. But obviously that wasn't the case, and there's a lot of uh, nefarious stuff that went on there. So, well, okay, so we've got one clip there. FBI is great. All right, that's Jill Sanborn. Let's what, see what Ameri else we've got over here. This one is another one, and she's going to tell us a little bit about how they're responding to these new threats. So we, now we've got all this, you know, domestic issues percolating up. What's going to happen? How are they? How is the new FBI under Jill Sanborn going to help us you know, work our way through the processing of these issues? Here she is. What the American people need to rely on us for is what are we doing to prevent the next attack? And I think that's really important because that requires not only an embracement of intelligence, but it also requires us to be imaginative and creative and challenge ourselves. Yes. We all come up with analytical assessments that mm -hmm. maybe were true yesterday that are different than today. And we all have ways in which we think terrorists could attack, but they could get creative in uh, their thoughts and plans. And we need to be equally as creative. For the equally as creative. Got to get creative out there. Which, you know, might involve planting a bunch of FBI undercover informants into a, you know, militia group and then becoming the majority of that group and then coercing the other people into going and participating in a plot. How is it their plot if the majority of the people are a part of the FBI, which is still speculation, right? We still don't have uh, data on that. But I really like that clip because she was talking about getting creative, right? Very fun, very creative stuff, which reminded me of that sort of that childhood creativity that we saw from the author of this affidavit during the arrest of one of the Capitol Hill defendants said during the arrest law enforcement recovered some other items including a don't tread on me flag but you'll also notice that they were very concerned they said that law enforcement also recovered a fully constructed U.S. Capitol Lego set. Oh my goodness, like the one right here. In addition, he had three firearms in addition to the Lego you know, set. So you might be sitting, to your, sitting there to yourself saying, well, you know, what, is a, what does a Lego set have to do with seizing control of the country? Well, the FBI, who are much smarter than you and I, they know what this means. They know that something like this can be used as a planning device especially if it's fully constructed, which I think is still, uh, I think that's actually erroneous. I think it was just in the box. So this could be the base of operations, right? They had a Lego set and this was how they're going to be, you know, poking around. Uh, Jacob Chansley is going to be over here and he's going to have the bullhorns and he's going to go on this side. And then you, grandma over here, you're going to come in this side. And then, uh, you know, the, the, the kids with the family, the Munn family. So they're all going to, you know, get their, their uh, picnic blanket and their turkey sandwiches and they're going to go in this, this way. And so all of this plotting was taking place there, right? It was somebody saying, yeah, in the box, right? It was in the box. And so I was very inspired by this story, this Lego story. And so fortunately, my friends, I wanted to show you what came in the mail this week. We've got 
our very own Lego set, my friends. This is the, the exact set that they're talking about. And I, I got this. I'm not planning to seize control of the country, although this would be useful if I did want to seize control of the country. I have the Lego set. I could basically plan and make sure that I could actually seize, seize power. But because I'm a very diplomatic, peaceful, loving, good-hearted American, I'm not going to be doing that. But I did look through this, and there's, there's no insur insurrection instructions on here. No insurrection. Jacob Chansley's not even on this. We've got some statutes over here, right? It's going to be a lot of fun to build this thing. FBI, I'm not trying to seize control of the Capitol building, okay? Take it easy. It's not even constructed. It's in the box. All right, so with that out of the way, now, you know, the, the FBI is getting very creative, so they're going to be looking for other Lego sets probably. We'll see where that goes. Now we have another clip. Jill Sanborn is going to be giving us some guidance on what the definition of domestic terrorism is. What does that mean? What does domestic terrorism mean? Because we're seeing this be sort of a very fluid definition. I don't know what it means. It, 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 it apparently means anything that the, the government doesn't like. It means sort of any ideology that you have that might be anti-government or libertarian, according to former CIA director John Brennan, saying libertarians might be domestic terrorists and things like that, right? Getting very, very problematic. The language is getting troubling. And so now we want to know, Jill Sanborn, how do you define this? What do you define domestic I'd terrorism I'd start to by be? saying domestic terrorism is defined what? by statute. Let me back that up. Here it is, Jill Sanborn. How do you define domestic terrorism? I'd start by saying domestic terrorism is defined by statute. So it's not the FBI's definition of domestic terrorism, but actually the U.S. Code. It's not always that clear cut whether this is a domestic terrorism act or not. Particularly if an individual dies in an attack, there may always be questions about why someone mobilized to violence on the day they chose to mobilize. But that's another reason it's so important that we, we here at the FBI, focus on the act or threat of violence because that's actually what we have to work to prevent in the future. All right. So it's hard to define domestic terrorism, right? And she says, don't listen to us. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to us. We're going to refer you over to the U.S. Code. The U.S. Code is what we refer, what we look to as the FBI. And uh, happily, I pulled that section up right here. We can see it's 18 U.S. Code 2331. And let's see how easy it is to fit within this category. So you'll notice it says domestic terrorism means that these are any activities, so you got to be doing something, that involve acts dangerous to human life, that are a violation of the criminal laws or of the United States or of any state. Okay, so it's got to be dangerous to human life. It has to be an activity. It's got to be a violation of the criminal code anywhere of the U.S. federal code or anywhere of any state. And that's just the first part of it. Then it also now has to be intended. Got to have one of these two different intentions. So we have an act. We talk about this as the actus reus. This is the physical act, something that needs to be done. And then we also have an intention, which is the mens rea, the mental state. We see it, it appears to be intended to do something. What's the intent behind the activity? to intimidate or coerce a civilian population. How about this? To influence the policy of a government by intimidation or coercion. Hmm, pretty broad. How about to affect the conduct of a government by mass destruction, assassination, or kidnapping? Yeah, that's pretty obvious, right? You can clearly define what that is. Kidnapping, assassination, a weapon of mass destruction, sure. But now we got some very, very gray words in here, don't we? And this must occur within the United States, of course. If it's outside the United States, that's gonna be uh, international foreign terrorism, this would be domestic terrorism. So here it says to intimidate or coerce a civilian population. I don't, you know, intimidation is a very loose word. Coercion is a very, very loose word. Same with influencing the policy of a government. And what does by intimidation mean? What does by coercion mean, right? You could make this argument for virtually any type of political protest that exists anywhere in this country. What, what, what BLM was doing, was that intimidation? Was that coercion? When they're going up to people, Having, rest, have, having dinner or lunch or breakfast at a, at a restaurant on the side of the road and going with bullhorns in their face, forcing them or demanding that they take knees, is that not intimidation? Is that not coercion? Is that not trying to coerce a civilian population into doing something that might impact the, the 
laws of the United States that would be a violation of the laws of the United States? Yes, you would, but you might say that that is not dangerous to human life, right? So this is where it kind of, kind of crosses that line. So acts that are dangerous to human life, that might be the limiting principle there. But you might not, right? It might be the threat. It might be, I've got a bullhorn, you take that knee. Otherwise, there are going to be some serious repercussions coming your direction. And any one of those implied impositions of consequence are, are naturally going to be dangerous. So it's very, very loose. This is why the FBI executive assistant director, Jill Sanborn, has a difficult time answering the question because it is broad. It reminds me of a statute like disorderly conduct. Disorderly conduct means it's conduct that's disorderly. I mean, basically that's what the statute says. Encompasses anything. Everybody's disorderly almost all the time for any, for any particular reason, right? You can just come up to somebody and say, well, you know, uh, you're, you're being loud over here, sir. And they go, well, I'm not. And they go, well, they think you are. Well, I'm not. Well, they said you are and they called the police. So now you're being disorderly. And the cops show up and they say, well, we just, we have to respond to their claim. And the statute is so broad. You can really use it to encompass virtually anything. And it drives me crazy because they can just charge you for any type of crime, no matter what. All right. So our last clip of Miss Sanborn, this is the one where she's doing the balancing act. And I don't like this answer at all. Tell me what you think. This is where she's trying to balance free speech and the protection of the constitutional rights versus protecting the American people. And she's going to tell us how the FBI deals with this. So you have to ask yourself sort of, you know, which one of those has higher priority? Does adhering to the United States Constitution or does protecting American lives? And she kind of has a cheater answer on this, but let's listen in and see what she has to say about that. So I think when people think about free speech and then how the FBI stays ahead of the threat and protects us from threats of violence is really important because the FBI is a dual hatted mission. And a lot of people don't probably understand that. They understand that our mission is to protect America and the American people, but equal is our mission to uphold the constitution. Equal. Not one is more important than the other, but they're mm. both important at the same time. So dual and simultaneous is what we like to say. Yeah. Not one at the expense of the other. And I think that's probably the most important aspect for me is protecting the American people is not more important than protecting the rights of the American people and upholding the constitution. That is the most challenging aspect about the domestic terrorism fight that we face because many of the people um, who have ideologies that could turn to a mobilization to violence are exercising and believing in their ideologies because it's their First Amendment protected right too. And the FBI has to be cognizant that our job is to protect that right, your belief, your speech, as much as it is to protect the American people from the act that you may conduct. Yes. Okay. So you know, there's a lot to break down there, my friends. You have dual and simultaneous, right? She's saying that you've got the U.S. Constitution, which is going to protect things like free speech. And then you've also got the FBI's inherent duty, which is to protect American lives. And so we have somebody in law enforcement who's saying that they're dual and simultaneous. One is not more important than the other, that your free speech is not more important than the protect the protection of American lives or that your you know, your ability to participate in an ideology, even though the FBI is going to respect your free speech rights, that doesn't give you the ability to do certain things that might put you in a position that might tip the scale into action. And so the FBI has got to be ready there. When that tips that scale into action, then they're going to spring into there and they're going to stop that because at that moment in time, your constitutional rights don't extend beyond you know, that into encroaching upon somebody else's safety and well-being in this country. So the FBI has got to juggle these two things. So that might sound good. It might sound logical on its face. I have a huge problem with it because that doesn't act, that's not how it works in practice. What ends up happening is it's not dual and simultaneous. The Constitution takes a back seat all the time, every time. When any, any law enforcement agent wants to come through and sort of, you know, do this little analysis in their head where they say, well, I'm pretty, you know, I'm pretty interested in protecting this person's rights, but they just trample all over it and they justify it in the name of justice or in the name of stopping crime or in the name of protecting America or stopping domestic terrorism. And she cleverly frames this as a free speech issue, right? She says, oh, well, it's your First Amendment right, your, your right to you know, uh, assembly and expression and all of that. The, the problem with dipping below the constitutional standard on that issue, with falling below the line, which is subpar behavior, right? We always say stay above the line. You know, keep your behavior above the line. The FBI, in my opinion, their line is the Constitution. They should never drop below that line. And there is no competing interest 
in the name of preserving American lives that justifies a drop below that line. She is saying that essentially that they're both sort of on an even playing field. And if you have to make this gamble between protecting American lives or preserving the Constitution, which way is she going to default? On what side of that coin is she going to land? And I know where it is. In my experience, I've seen it. They always land on the side of the government, law enforcement, or whatever investigation they're working on, and the Constitution always suffers. So she frames it in the context of free speech and free association. The way that this happens practically is you get all of your other rights trampled as well. In addition to that, you get your right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures trampled when the police just pull you over and take whatever they want, look at whatever they want, you know, in, in, open whatever they want. They, they, they step all over those. They make pretextual stops and they make up all sorts of different excuses for continuing their investigation. And they justify it on the basis of, of justice, right? We've got this dual and simultaneous thing. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. The Constitution takes a back seat all the time because these law enforcement agencies justify it. Should never be the case. We say this all the time in criminal law. I'd rather a thousand innocent, I'm sorry, a thousand guilty people go free than one innocent person go into custody. And the reason, and the, the way that we protect that is by holding that line. It's by holding the standard. It's by making sure that none of these bureaucrats, none of these law enforcement officials get away with this propaganda BS. It's nonsense that the Constitution is somehow you know, analogous to whatever she deems to be appropriate to go in and investigate. If she, if she deems Jill Sanborn and the FBI and the Biden administration or any bureaucrat, any Republican administration, if they get in there and they say, well, we have deemed this to be a threat to national security and the American people, and we know we've got a, a, a duty to protect the Constitution, but we deem this to be more of a, of a problem. And so we're just going to violate your right to be free from searches and seizures, violate your right to counsel, violate your right against self-incrimination, violate your right to due process and the right to be you know, let out on your own recognizance. All of that takes a back seat and they all justify it on the basis of justice and law enforcement and national security and domestic terrorism and white supremacy and all of the other ills. They just lump it into this bucket because it gives them more power and more control and it's disgusting behavior and it's reprehensible. What do you have to say about it? Let's take a look at the chat and see what's going on. Probably got some questions coming in over from watching the watchers.locals.com. So let me get those pulled up over here if I can find my mouse. And I think we have some questions from, let's see here. All right. Didn't have this queued up where I wanted it. So let's see where we've got over here. All right. First question is from want to know says that the FBI is. The FBI is busy investigating everyone from January 6. I'm sure there is a littering charge that hasn't been fully investigated. A lot of people there Did they get defunded too. I do like the raid jacket though. in the post makes it look very official. Yeah. You know, maybe the FBI should be defunded. Uh, if, if any, if any law enforcement agency is being defunded. Oh, we had a super chat come in from Lil Panda Cub said you are so cute. Happy Lego. And I, and I, yeah, thank you for that. Okay. So that, thank you for that there, Lil Panda Cub. I'm pretty excited about that Lego set. No, no, no joke. Red pilled convict says was Trasker an expert in domestic violence, extremism or extreme domestic violence. Love that. Love that. Bravo. Well done. Yeah. It sounds like he's kind of the man for the job, isn't he? Because he knows all about extreme domestic violence, <laughs> which is funny, isn't this? It, it, look, that, that case is not funny. But if you recall, like six months ago, as soon as we started to hear Biden come out and say this uh, domestic violent extremism, I, I said at the time, I said, they're trying to use the same pejorative feeling, the same sense that you get when you hear the word domestic violence. They're just going to apply that same sort of feeling that you've already been conditioned to feel, and they're going to attach that to all of the Trump supporters. And I think it was a very clever uh, attempt there. We also have Peely Wheelie is here, says, Rob, hope you're well. With all respect to the American people, as someone who lives outside the U.S., to hear Jill Sanborn talk about the FBI as the best in the world, what a joke. Just looking at America from infighting from the last six years, mainly, how can anyone think America is a world leader? If a family member was acting like America is, you would kick them out of the house for causing troubles. Peely Wally, yeah. And, and that's kind of, that, that was kind of my perspective on that. You know, when, when uh, Joe Biden was out there yesterday from his town hall saying that the world is like, oh, you're back. You're back, Joe. Are you, are you really back? And Joe said, yeah, we're really back, guys. I'm thinking, what? Do, do they all, do, do the rest of the world hang on everything that Americans do? I mean, how, 
what? Kamala Harris did this when she went down to Guatemala. Was, Don't you come to America, people. And going, listen, folks, the rest of the world, they've got their own problems. They've got their own nationalism. They've got their own internal interests that they have to be worried about. And so, you know, America, you know, get your, get your house in order, I think, a little bit. Uh, Rob, uh, Aircraft Mech says, Rob, you should hold a raffle for the Lego set and autograph it. Oh, my gosh, that's... That's a great idea. I don't know what my autograph would do. Uh, nothing other than ruin a perfectly good Lego set. But yeah, maybe we could do that for a, for a charity or something. I like that idea a lot. That would be fun. Great idea there, Aircraft. Want to know says Lego and the pillow from Lindell. Guns demonetized on YouTube. <laughs> uh, I see a pattern here. And a liberal, really? Short hair, goes against government prosecutors daily and gets paid for it. Believes in free speech. I do. I have Lindell's pillows. Actually, they're right over there. <laughs> so, so it's, uh, it's, yeah, it, it, there's an interesting pattern going on. Good to see you want to know. Leafy Bug is here, says, Rob, you crack me up. Does that Lego set show how to get to AOC's office? <laughs> I, 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 I'm not sure if it came with the miniature Lego man that had his feet up on the desk or I don't know if the podium's in there either. So we'll have to take a look at that. Uh, good to see you. Leafy Bug. We have Sergeant Bob with Miss Lucky. Sergeant Bob is in the house and he's got an answer here. Here's what he says. The Constitution is superior. There it is, folks. That's from the sergeant. Sergeant Bob. We have the best. We have the best popo on this show. The best. The best sergeants here ever. Good to see you, Sergeant Bob. Shout out, Miss Lucky. Good to see you both. Uh, let's see. We got a couple more coming in. I see. I see a super chat over there from Zulu. So we're gonna get to that here in a minute. We got Sharon Quidney says. So now it looks like anybody doing anything the current regime doesn't like, like maybe, say, trying to influence people to vote for a non-approved candidate could be arrested or tried or imprisoned for domestic terrorism. Looks kind of like protecting the regime is the FBI's new first responsibility, kind of like the KGB, perhaps. That was from Sharon Quidney. I know Trump, Trump, Trump is here, says Rob, congratulations on your purchase of the Lego set. I left a set similar to that, along with my letter to Biden when I left the big house. Not sure. I'm sure you're now on a list, a big, beautiful list. It's a list that's so important. I would definitely not encouraging purchasing the matching White House set. You would likely get a visit from some very important people like people in black SUVs and wearing suits. Oh, I know. I know. I'm in trouble now because I bought that Lego set. I'm nonviolent. I've never, uh, uh, I've never advocated for violence on this show. I just happen to like Legos. I had, a, I had tons of Legos growing up. They were a lot of fun. Sharon Quidney says, I hate to say this, but as a country, looks to me like we have turned a corner down a very dark alley here. Uh, I, yeah, I know. It, 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 it can feel a little bit doom and gloom. I think we're kind of in, uh, in, in a dark, maybe, maybe a little darkness right now. But the country is rapidly waking up, and there's some excitement about that. We have three girlies is in the house, says, if the FBI was involved in all these plots, can't that be entrapment? Yeah, it can. It really can. And it's sort of the, qu the question becomes, you know, whether they were going to do it with the FBI. I'm sorry, whether they were going to do it anyways, regardless of what the FBI's involvement was, right? It, it, it's, it's, it's entrapment if they would not have done it but for the FBI. The FBI were integral to that happening. And so let's finish up your comment it says a difference between proactive community policing and corrupt right infringing policing. The FBI, NSA, ATF, and many other three letter agencies in our government should be defunded. When they start putting their policies before our rights, that's corrupt policing. Outstanding comment there, three girlies. Absolutely love that. And I couldn't agree more. Zulu's here. Zulu says, I feel like we should get a solid close up shot of the thumb. So right now it's not very good viewing viewable, but this is, uh, this is rock tape now. So I went to the, I actually did go to the gym this morning. I was not bleeding all over the place like a sieve and uh, there's a nice bandaid on there. And so this is just regular rock tape that is not going to focus probably. There it is. It's not going to focus because my head's in the way, probably. Anyways, you can see it. It's pretty, it's pretty gnarly. I looked at it this morning and I thought, yeah, that's a whole, that's a whole uh, top of your thumb is now gone. So, uh, so interesting. When, I, when I'm able to not sort of bleed all over the place, I'll definitely give you a, a zoomed in close up if you want it. I would, I, I'd give you a content warning on that one, though. It might, it might violate the gore policy here on YouTube. So great questions, all of those from watching the watchers.locals.com and the super chats over there from YouTube. Appreciate all the love and support. Thank you very much for all of your great questions.
Thanks so much for watching. Before you head out, I want to just remind you that I am a criminal defense lawyer here in Scottsdale, Arizona, where my team and I, we've got a long history of helping good people facing criminal charges to find safety, clarity, and hope in their cases and beyond that in their lives. Our phone number for a free case evaluation is 480-787-0394. You can also find us online at www.rrlawaz.com. We can help with any type of criminal charge in the state of Arizona, things like DUI, drug offenses, misdemeanor offenses. And we can also help with clearing up old case records like expunging cases or making sure that you can restore your rights so that you can vote again or possess a firearm again or apply for some other federal benefits. We can remove mugshots off the internet. Basically, any time that you or somebody you know or love is in trouble with the law in the state of Arizona, we have an amazing team of people. We would just love the opportunity to help. And our phone number, of course, 480-787-0393. Nine, four. And if you don't need any legal services, that's a very good thing, but you may be interested in some informational offerings so that you are prepared if you do have to deal with the police. And of course, I want to invite you to head on over to gumroad.com slash Robert Gruler. You'll notice here, I've got several different trainings that are available, including the law enforcement interaction training. This is the one, two, three rule for dealing with the police. It's one rule you need, two questions that the police can ask of you, and three responses if they ask you a problematic question. So that's available now. You can also get a load up my personal productivity system here called Existence Systems. Fun little course. And then we have here, if you're a lawyer or a legal professional, be sure to check out this program. We are meeting twice every month. Again, all of this over at Gumroad dot com slash Robert Gruler. And if none of that sounds any good to you, well, just go ahead and, and give us a follow because I'm working on some other products and some other offerings. And of course, if you have not already done so, want to invite you one more time to head on over to watching the watchers dot locals dot com. It's where you can support the show and it's where we can connect. We've got monthly Zoom meetings and a lot of other goodies coming up. So I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you so much for watching and for all of your love and support. I will see you on the next one.